Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I'm Bill Mallory, Branch Manager of the La Jolla Library. I'm so glad you could join me today for today's reading of Treasure Island. Today we'll be reading chapters 18, 19, and 20. Um, just to give you a brief recap of what has gone before, um, our uh, heroes, Jim Hawkins, the young man from the, from the hotel, and um, his friends, Squire Trelawney and Dr. Livesey, um, as well as a few of their of their servants, are on board the ship, the Hispaniola, which is being captained by Captain Smollett, and has uh, recently been taken over by uh, Long John Silver, the ship's cook, and all the men who are loyal to him, which is pretty much all of them, except for the ones I just mentioned. So, what has happened so far is that uh, Jim, while hiding in an apple barrel, has heard the plans of the crew, uh, specifically Long John Silver, who everyone thought they could trust, and uh, speaking to another pirate named Israel Hands, and uh, they together uh, were talking about what they plan to do and how they plan to mutiny once the treasure is on board the ship. Um, the, the plan now has been been to reach the island, um, and so they have, and Jim Hawkins has uh, kind of, they've met uh, the uh, another pirate who was stranded there by Captain Flint uh, three years prior by the name of Ben Gunn, and uh, so, so Jim and Ben Gunn are, you know, basically conversing, and, and uh, Jim's kind of uh, getting the lay of the land from from Ben Gunn, while the Dr. Livesey and uh, the Squire and all of their men have found a stockade on the island, and they are using that as a fortification to uh, protect themselves against the mutinying pirates, who, uh, will, of course, want the treasure, want to get back on board the ship and sail away. So, if you are ready... I know I am. We will start chapter 18. Um, narrative continued by the doctor. End of the first day's fighting. So in this case, we, our main character, our narr narrator throughout this uh, story up until just a couple of chapters ago was Jim Hawkins. And now, since Jim is kind of having his own adventure with Ben Gunn, uh, we are now looking at... Um, the narr narrative through the eyes of Dr. Livesey, a magistrate and physician. We made our best speed across the strip of wood that now divided us from the stockade, and at every step we took the voices of the buccaneers, uh, every step we took, the voices of the buccaneers rang nearer. Soon we could hear their footfalls as they ran, and the crashing of the branches as they breasted across a bit of thicket. I began to see we should have a brush for it in earnest, and looked to my priming. Captain, said I, Trelawney is the dead shot. Give him your gun. His own is useless. They exchanged guns, and Trelawney, silent and cool as he had been since the beginning of the bustle, hung a moment on his heel to see that all was fit for service. <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, observing Gray to be unharmed, I handed him my cutlass. It did all our hearts good to see him spit in his hand, knit his brows, and make the blade sing through the air. It was plain from every line of his body that our new hand was worth his salt. Forty paces farther we came to the edge of the wood, and we saw the stockade in front of us. We struck the enclosure about the middle of the south side, and, almost at the same time, seven mutineers, Job Anderson, the boatswain at their head, appeared in full cry at the southwestern uh, corner. They paused, as if taken aback, but before they recovered, not only the squire and I, but Hunter and Joyce from the blockhouse had time to fire. The, the four shots came in, rather a scattering volley, but they did the business. One of the enemy actually fell, and the rest, without hesitation, 
turned, and plunged into the trees. After reloading, we walked down the outside of the palisade to see the fallen enemy. He was stone dead, shot through the heart. We began to rejoice over our good success when, just at that moment, a pistol cracked in the bush. A ball whistled close past my ear, and poor Tom Redruth stumbled and fell his length on the ground. Both the squire and I returned the shot, but as we had nothing to aim at, it is probable we only wasted powder. Then we reloaded and turned our attention to poor Tom. The captain and Gray were already examining him, and I saw with half an eye that all was over. I believe the readiness of our return volley had scattered the mutineers once more, for we were suffered without further molestation to get to the poor gamekeeper hoisted over the stockade and carried, groaning and bleeding, into the log house. Poor old fellow. He had not uttered one word of surprise, complaint, fear, or even acquiescence from the very beginning of our troubles till now. When we had laid him down in the long house to die, um, and, well, when we had laid him down in the log house to die, <laughs> he had lain like a Trojan behind his mattress in the gallery. He had followed every order silently, doggedly as well. He was the oldest of our party by a score of years, and now sullen, old, serviceable servant, it was he that was to die. The squire dropped down beside him on his knees and kissed his hand, crying like a child. "'Be I going, doctor?' he asked. "'Tom, my man,' said I, "'you're going home.' "'I wish I had had a lick at them with the gun first, he replied. "'Tom,' said the squire, "'say you forgive me, won't you?' "'Would that be respectable-like from me to you, squire?' was the answer. "'Howsoever, so be it. Amen.' After a little while of silence, he said he thought somebody might read a prayer. "'It's the custom, sir,' he added apologetically. And not long after, without another word, he passed away. In the meantime, the captain, whom I had observed to be wonderfully swollen about the chest and pockets, had turned out a great many various stores. The British colors, a Bible, a coil of stoutish rope, pen, ink, and the log book, and pounds of tobacco. He had found a longish fir tree lying felled and cleared in the enclosure, and with the help of Hunter, he had it set up at the corner of the log house where the trunks crossed and made an angle. Then, climbing on the roof, he had with his own hand bent and run up the colors. This seemed mightily to relieve him. He entered the log house and set about counting up the stores, as if nothing else existed. It existed. But he had an eye on Tom's passage for all that, and... As soon as all was over, he came forward with another flag, and reverently spread it on the body. "'Don't you take on air, don't you take on, sir,' he said, shaking the squire's hand. "'All's well with him. No fear for a hand that's been shot down in his duty to captain and owner. It mayn't be good divinity, but it's a fact.' Then he pulled me aside. Uh, Dr. Livesey, he said, in how many weeks do you and Squire expect the consort? I told him it was a question not of weeks, but of months, that if we were not back by the end of August, Blandly was to send to find, at, to find us, but neither sooner nor later. You can calculate for yourself, I said. Why, yes, returned the captain, scratching his head, and making a large allowance, sir, for all the gifts of providence, I should say we were pretty close hauled. How do you mean? I asked. It's a pity, sir, we lost that second load. 
That's what I mean, replied the captain. As for powder and shot, we'll do, but the rations are short. Very short. So short, Dr. Livesey, that we're perhaps as well without that extra mouth. Uh, and he pointed to the dead body under the flag. Just then, with a roar and a whistle, a round shot passed high above the roof of the log house and plumped far beyond us in the wood. Ho, ho, cried the captain. Blaze away. You've little enough powder already, my lads. At the second trial, the aim was better, and the ball descended inside the stockade, scattering a cloud of sand, but doing no further damage. Captain, said the squire, the house is quite invisible from the ship. It would be the flag they are aiming at. Would it not be wiser to take it in? Strike my colors, cried the captain. No, sir, not I. And as soon as he had said the, the words, I think we all agreed with him, for it was not only a piece of stout, seamanly good feeling, it was good policy besides, and showed our enemies that we despised their cannonade. All through the evening they kept thundering away, ball after ball flew or fell short, or kicked up sand in the enclosure, but they had to fire so high that the shot fell dead and buried itself in the soft sand. We had no ricochet to fear, and though one popped in through the roof of the log house and out again through the floor, we soon got used to that sort of horseplay and minded it no more than cricket. There is one thing good about all this, observed the captain. The wood in front of us is likely clear. The ebb has made a good while. Our stores should be uncovered. Volunteers to go and bring in pork. Gray and Hunter were the first to come forward. Well armed, they stole out of the stockade, but it proved a useless mission. The mutineers were bolder than we fancied or they put more trust in Israel's gunnery. For four or five of them were busy carrying off stores and wading out with them to one of the gigs that lay close by, pulling an oar or so to hold her steady against the current. Silver was in the stern, the, in the stern sheets in command, and every man of them was now provided with a musket from some secret magazine of their own. The captain sat down to his log, and here is the beginning of the entry. Alexander Smollett, master, David Livesey, ship's doctor, Abraham Gray, carpenter's mate, John Trelawney, owner, John Hunter and Richard Joyce, owner's servants, landsmen. Being all that is left faithful of the ship's company, with stores for ten days at short rations, came ashore this day and flew British colors on the log house in Treasure Island. Thomas Redruth, owner's servant, landsman, shot by the mutineers. James Hawkins, cabin boy. At that same time, I was wondering over poor Jim Hawkins' fate. A hail on the land side. Somebody's hailing us, said Hunter, who was on guard. A doctor! "'Squire, Captain, hello, Hunter. Is that you?' came the cries. And I ran to the door in time to see Jim Hawkins, safe and sound, come climbing over the stockade. Chapter 19 Narrative Resumed by Jim Hawkins, The Garrison in the Stockade As soon as Ben Gunn saw the colors, he came to a halt stopped me by the arm and sat down. Now, said he, there's your friends, sure enough. Far more, um, I'm sorry, far more likely it's the mutineers, I answered. That, he cried, why, in a place like this, where nobody puts in but gentlemen of fortune, silver would fly the Jolly Roger, and you don't make no doubt of that. No, that's your friends. There's been blows, too, and I reckon your friends has had the best of it. And here they are ashore in the old stockade, as was made years and years ago by Flint. Ah, 
He was the man to have a headpiece was Flint. Barring rum, his match were never seen. He were afraid of none, not he. Only silver. Silver was that genteel. Well, said I, that may be so, and so be it. All the more reason that I should hurry on and join my friends. Nay, mate, returned Ben, not you. You're a good boy, or I'm mistook. But you're only a boy, all told. Now Ben Gunn is fly. Rum wouldn't bring me there, where you're going. Not rum wouldn't, till I see your born gentleman and gets it on his word of honor, and you won't forget my words. A precious sight, that's what you'll say, a precious sight more confidence, and then nips him. And he pinched me the third time with the same air of cleverness. And when Ben Gunn is wanted, you know where to find him, Jim. Just where you found him today, and him that comes is to have a white thing in his hand, and he's to come alone. Oh, and you'll say this, Ben Gunn, says you, has reasons of his own. Well, said I, I believe I understand. You have something to propose, and you wish to see the squire or the doctor, and you're to be found where I found you. Is that all? And when, says you, he added, why, from about noon observation to about six bells. Good, said I. And now, may I go? You won't forget, he inquired anxiously. Precious sight and reasons of his own, says you. Reasons of his own, that's the mainstay, as you, as between man and man. Well then, still holding me, I reckon you can go, Jim, and... Jim, if you has if you was to see silver, you wouldn't go for to sell Ben Gunn. Wild horses wouldn't draw it from you. No, says you. And if them pirates camp ashore, Jim, what would you uh, what would you say? But there'd be winners in the morning. Here he was interrupted by the a loud report and a cannonball came, tearing through the trees and pitched in the sand not a hundred yards from where we two were talking. The next moment each of us had taken to his heels in a different direction. For a good hour to come, frequent reports shook the island, and balls kept crashing through the woods. I moved from hiding place to hiding place, always pursued, or so it seemed to me, by these terrifying missiles. But towards the end of the bombardment, though still I durst not venture in the direction of the stockade, where the balls fell oftenest, I had begun in a manner to pluck up my heart again, and after a long detour to the east crept down among the shoreside trees. The sun had just set, the sea breeze was rustling and tumbling in the woods, and ruffling the grey surface of the anchorage. The tide, too, was far out, and great tracts of sand lay uncovered. The air, after the heat of the day, chilled me through my jacket. The Hispaniola still lay where she had anchored, but, sure enough, there was the Jolly Roger, the black flag of piracy, flying from her peak. Even as I looked, there came another red flash and another, re and another report, that sent the echoes clattering, and one more round shot whistled through the air. It was the last of the cannonade. I lay for some time, watching the bustle which succeeded the attack. Men were demolishing something with axes on the beach near the stockade. The poor jolly boat, I afterwards discovered. Away near the mouth of the river, a great fire was glowing among the trees, and between that point and the ship, one of the gigs kept coming and going, the men, whom I had seen so gloomy, shouting at the oars like children. But there was a sound in their voices, which suggested rum. At length, I thought, I might return towards the stockade. I was pretty far down on the low, sandy spit, that encloses the anchorage to the east and is joined at half water to Skeleton Island, and now, as I rose to my feet, I saw some distance further down the spit 
and rising from among low bushes, an isolated rock, pretty high and peculiarly white in color. It occurred to me that this might be the white rock of which Ben Gunn had spoken, and that some day or other a boat might be wanted, and I should know where to look for one. Then I skirted among the woods until I had regained the rear, or shoreward, side of the stockade, and was soon welcomed by the faithful party. I had soon told my story and began to look about me. The log house was made of unsquared trunks of pine, roof, walls, and floor. The latter stood in several places as much as a foot or a foot and a half above the surface of the sand. There was a porch at the door, and under this porch the little spring welled up into an artificial basin of a rather odd kind, no other than a ship's kettle of iron, with the bottom knocked out and sunk to her bearings, as the captain said, among the sand. Little had been left beside the framework of the house, but in one corner there was a stone slab laid down by way of hearth, and a rusty, an old rusty iron basket to contain the fire. The slopes of the knoll and all inside of the stockade had been cleared of timber to build the house, and we could see by the stumps of a fine, uh, what a fine and lofty grove had been destroyed. Most of the soil had been washed away or buried in drift after the removal of the trees, only where the streamlet ran down from the kettle, a thick bed of moss and some ferns and little creeping bushes were still green among the sand. Very close around the stockade, too close for defense, they said, the wood still flourished high and dense, all of fir on the land side, but towards the sea with a large admixture of live oaks. The cold evening breeze of which I have spoken whistled through every chink of the rude building and um, and sprinkled the floor with a continual rain of fine sand. There was sand in our eyes, sand in our teeth, sand in our suppers, sand dancing in the spring at the bottom of the kettle, for all the world like porridge beginning to boil. Our chimney was a square hole in the roof. It was but a little part of the smoke that found its way out, and the rest eddied about the house and kept us coughing and piping the eye. Add to this that Gray, the new man, had his face tied up in a bandage for a cut he had got in breaking away from the mutineers, and that poor old Tom Redruth, still unburied, lay among, along the wall stiff and stark under the Union Jack. If we had been allowed to sit idle, we should all have fallen in the blues, but Captain Smollett was never the man for that. All hands were called up before him, and he divided us into watches. The doctor and Gray, and I, for one, the squire, Hunter, and Joyce, upon the other. Tired as we all were, two were sent out for firewood, two more were sent to dig a grave for Redruth. The doctor was named Cook. I was put sentry at the door, and the captain himself went from one to another, keeping up our spirits and lending a hand wherever it was wanted. From time to time the doctor came to the door for a little air and to rest his eyes, which were almost smoked out of his head, and whenever he did so, he had a word for me. "'That man Smollett,' he said once, "'is a better man than I am.' And when I say that, it means a deal, Jim. Another time he came and was silent for a while. Then he put his head to one side and looked at me. Is this Ben Gunn a man? I asked. He asked. I do not know, sir, said I. I am not very sure whether he's sane. If there is any doubt about the matter, he is, returned the doctor. A man who has been three years biting his nails on a desert island, Jim, can't expect to appear as sane as you or me. It doesn't lie in human nature. Was it cheese you said he had a fancy for? Yes, sir, cheese, I answered. Well, Jim, says he, 
Just see the good that comes of being dainty in your food. You've seen my snuff box, haven't you? And you never saw me take snuff. The reason being that my snuff, uh, that in my snuff box I carry a piece of Parmesan cheese, a cheese made in Italy, very nutritious. Well, that's for Ben Gunn. Before supper was eaten, we buried old Tom in the sand and stood around him for a while, bareheaded in the breeze. A good deal of firewood had been got in, but not enough for the captain's fancy, and he shook his head over it and told us, we must get back to this tomorrow rather livelier. Then when we had eaten our pork, and each had a good stiff glass of brandy grog, the three chiefs got together in a corner to discuss our prospects. It appeared they were at uh, their wit's end what to do, the stores being so low that we must have been starved into surrender long before help came. But our best hope, it was decided, was to kill off the buccaneers until they either hauled down their flag or ran away with the Hispaniola. From 19, they were already reduced to 15. Two others were wounded, and one, at least, the man shot beside the gun, severely wounded, if he were not dead. Every time we had a crack at them, we were to take it, saving our own lives with the extremest care. And besides that, we had two able allies, rum and climate. As for the first, though we were about a half a mile away, we could hear them roaring and singing late into the night. And as for the second, the doctor staked his wig, that camped where they were in the marsh and unprovided with remedies, the half of them would be on their backs before a week. So, he added, if we're not all shot down first, they'll be glad to be packing in the schooner. It's always a ship, and they, they can get to buccaneering again, I suppose. First ship that I ever lost, that ever I lost, said Captain Smollett. I was dead tired, as you may fancy, and when I got to sleep, which was not long after a great deal of tossing, I slept like a log of firewood. The rest had long been up and had already uh, and had already breakfasted and increased the pile of firewood by about half as much again when I was awakened by a bustle and the sound of voices. Flag of truce, I heard somebody say, and then immediately after, with a cry of surprise, Silver himself. And at that, I jumped, and rubbing my eyes, ran to a loophole in the wall. Chapter 20 Silver's Embassy Sure enough, there were two men just outside the stockade, one of them waving a white cloth, the other, no less a person than Silver himself, standing placidly by. It was still quite early, and the coldest morning that I think I ever was abroad in, a chill that pierced into the mar marrow. The sky was bright and cloudless overhead, and the tops of the trees shone rosily in the sun. But where Silver stood with his lieutenant, all was still in shadow and they waded knee-deep in a low white vapor that had crawled during the night out of the morass. The chill and the vapor, taken together, told a poor tale of the island. It was plainly a damp, feverish, unhealthy spot. "'Keep indoors, men,' said the captain. Ten to one, this is a trick.' Then he hailed the buccaneer. "'Who goes? Stand, or we fire!' "'Flag of truce!' cried Silver. The captain was on the porch, keeping himself carefully out of the way of a treacherous shot, should any be intended. He turned and spoke to us. "'Doctor's watch on the lookout. Dr. Livesey, take the north side, if you please. Jim, the east, gray, west.' The watch below, all hands to load muskets. Lively, men, and be and careful. Then he turned again to the mutineers. And what do you want with your flag of truce? 
he cried. This time it was the other man who replied, Captain Silver, sir, to come on board and make terms, he shouted. Captain Silver, don't know him. Who's he? said the captain. And we could hear him adding to himself, Captain, is it my heart and here's promotion? Long John answered for himself, Me, sir, these poor lads have chosen me, Captain, after your desertion, sir laying a particular emphasis on the word desertion. We're willing to submit if we can come on, come to terms, and no bones about it. All I ask is your word, Captain Smollett, to let me safe and sound out of this here stockade, and one minute to get out a shot before a gun is fired. My man, said Captain Smollett, I have not the slightest desire to talk to you. If you wish to talk to me, you can come that's all. If there's any treachery, it'll be on your side, and Lord help you. That's enough, Captain, shouted Long John cheerily. A word from you's enough. I know a gentleman, and you may lay to that. We could see the man who carried the flag of truce attempting to hold Silver back. Nor was that wonderful, uh, nor was that wonderful seeing how cavalier had been the captain's answer. But Silver laughed at him aloud and slapped him on the back as if the, eye, uh, the idea of alarm had been absurd. Then he advanced to the stockade, threw over his crutch, got a leg up, and with great vigor and skill succeeded in surmounting the fence and dropping safely to the other side. I will confess that I was far too much taken up with what was going on to be of the slightest use as sentry. Indeed, I had already deserted my eastern loophole and crept up behind the captain, who had now seated himself on the threshold, with his elbows on his knees, his head in his hands and his eyes fixed on the water as it bubbled out of the old iron kettle in the sand. He was whistling to himself, Come, lasses and lads. Silver had terrible hard work getting up the knoll, what with the steepness of the incline, the thick tree stumps, and the soft sand, he and his crutch were as helpless as a ship in stays. But he stuck to it like a man in silence, and at last arrived before the captain, whom he saluted in the handsomest style. He was tricked out in his best, an immense blue coat, thick with brass buttons, hung as low as to his knees, and a fine laced hat was set on the back of his head. "'Here you are, my man,' said the captain, raising his head. "'You had better sit down.' "'You ain't a going to let me inside, Captain,' complained Long John. "'It's a main cold morning, to be sure, sir, to sit outside upon the sand.' "'Why, Silver,' said the captain, "'if you had Pleased to be an honest man, you might have been sitting in your galley. It's your own doing. You're either my ship's cook, and then you were treated handsome, or Captain Silver, a common mutineer and pirate, and then you can go hang. Well, well, Captain, returned the sea cook, sitting down as he was bitten on the sand. You'll have to give me a hand up again, that's all. A sweet, pretty place you have it here. Ah, there's Jim. The top of the morning to you, Jim. Doctor, here's my service. Why, there you all are together, like a happy family, in a matter of speaking. If you have anything to say, my man, better say it, said the captain. Right you are, Captain Smollett, replied Silver. Duty is duty, to be sure. Well, now. You look here, that was a good lay of yours last night. I don't deny it was a good lay. But some of you pretty handy with a handspike end. And I'll not deny either, but that some of my people was shook. Maybe all was shook. Maybe I was shook myself. Maybe that's why I'm here, for terms. But you mark me, Captain. It won't do twice, by thunder. We'll have to do sentry and go. Go and ease off a point or so on the rum. 
maybe you think we were all in a sheet in the wind's eye. But I'll tell you, I was sober. I was only dog-tired, and if I'd awoke a second sooner, I'd have caught you in the act. I would. He wasn't dead when I got round to him, not he. Well, says Captain Smollett, as cool as can be, all that Silver said was a riddle to him, but you would never have guessed it from his tone. As for me, I began to have an inkling. Ben Gunn's last words came back to my mind. I began to suppose that he had paid the buccaneers a visit while they all lay drunk together round their fire, and I reckoned up with glee that we had only fourteen enemies to deal with. "'Well, here it is,' said Silver. "'We want that treasure, and we'll have it. That's our point. You would just as soon save your lives, I reckon, and that's yours.' You have a chart, haven't you? That's as may be, replied the captain. Ah, well, you have, I know that, returned Long John. You needn't be so husky with a man. There ain't a particle of service in that, and you may lay to it. What I mean is we want your chart. Now, I never meant you no harm myself. "'That won't do with me, my man,' interrupted the captain. "'We know exactly what you mean to do, and we don't care for now. "'You see, you can't do it.' "'The captain looked at, at, the captain looked at him calmly and proceeded to fill a pipe. "'If Abe Gray,' Silver broke out, "'Avast there!' cried Mr. Smollett. "'Gray told me nothing, and I asked him nothing.' And what's more, I would see you and him and this whole island blown clean out of the water into blazes first. So there's my mind for you, my man, on that. This little whiff of temper seemed to cool Silver down. He had been growing nettled before, but now he pulled himself together. Like enough, said he, I would set no limits to what gentlemen might consider ship shape, or might not, as the case were. And, seeing as how you are about to take a pipe, Captain, I'll make so free as to do likewise. And he filled a pipe and lighted it, and the two men sat silently smoking for a, a, quite a while, now looking at each other in the face, now stopping their tobacco, now leaning forward to spit. It was as good as the play to see them. Now resumed Silver. Here it is. You give us the chart to get the, the treasure by and drop shooting and, and drop shooting poor seamen and stoving of their heads in while asleep. You do that and we'll offer you a choice. Either you come aboard along of us once the treasure is shipped and then I'll give you my affidavy upon my word of honor to clap you some, somewhere safe ashore. Or, if that ain't to your fancy, some of my hands being rough and having old scores on account of hazing, then you can stay here, you can. We'll divide stores with you, man for man, and I'll give my Affy Davy, as before, to speak the first ship I sight and send them here to pick you up. Now you'll, now you'll own that's talking. Handsomer you couldn't look to get, not you. And I hope, raising his voice, that all hands in this here blockhouse will overhaul my words, for what is spoke to one is spoke to all. Captain Smollett rose from his seat and knocked out the ashes of his pipe in the palm of his left hand. Is that all? he asked. Every last word, by thunder, answered John. Refuse that, and you've seen the last of me, but musket balls. Very good, said the captain. Now you'll hear me. If you'll come up one by one unarmed, I'll engage to clap you all in irons and take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, my name is Alexander Smollett. I've flown my sovereign's colors, and I'll see you all to Davy Jones. You can't find the treasure. You can't sail the ship. 
There's not a man among you fit to sail the ship. You can't fight us. Gray, there, got away from five of you. Your ship's in irons, Master Silver. You're on a lee shore, and so you'll find. I stand here and tell you so, and they're the last good words you'll get from me, for in the name of heaven, I'll put a bullet in your back when next I meet you. Tramp, my lad, bundle out of this, please, hand over hand, and double quick. Silver's face was a picture. His eyes started in his head, like with wrath, he shook the fire out of his pipe. Give me a hand up, he cried. Not I, returned the captain. Who'll give me a hand up, he roared. Not a man among us moved. Growling the foulest imprecations, he crawled along the sand till he got a hold of the porch and could hoist himself again upon his crutch. Then he spat into the spring. There, he cried, that's what I think of ye. Before an hour's out, I'll stove in your old blockhouse like a rum puncheon. Laugh by thunder, laugh. Before an hour's out, you'll laugh upon the other side. Them that'll die be the lucky ones. And with a dreadful oath, he stumbled off, plowed down the sand, was helped across the stockade after four or five failures by the man with the flag of truce, and disappeared in an instant afterwards among the trees. And that, my friends, concludes chapter 20. Oh, goodness, uh, there is some language going on here, and a lot of stuff happening, and uh, it's getting exciting. It's kind of been exciting all throughout, but it's uh, this is certainly one of the one of the better parts, I think. The parlay between Captain Smollett and Long John and uh, a setting of terms, and it's just it's wonderful to hear them kind of go back and forth like that. Um, thank you for joining me for uh, today's uh, reading of Treasure Island at the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. Um, I hope you have a good weekend. Please join us again on Monday. Monday will be a holiday. But we will be doing uh, another reading uh, for another the next three chapters, and it will be a pre-recorded uh, meeting, just like today's. But uh, I hope you uh, will will join me for it and uh, and take part in the, in Treasure Island, this grand adventure. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. We'll see you again. Bye, everyone.